I am Ryan McKnight. I'm Kara Santa Maria. I am Christopher Smith. Hi, I'm Andrew Torres. This, this is Naked Mormonism. Mormonism, the Serial Mormon History Podcast. The Higbees, the Fosters, and the Laws in May of 1844. Are you in the know, dear listener? Do you understand the gravity of what we're talking about yet? Hopefully it'll be clear by the end of today's episode. Next episode is the big number at 200, and we've got an exciting topic to discuss. But first, we have to talk about our final pillar of our trio of insurrection, the laws. We've discussed the Fosters and the Higbees in the last two episodes, but the laws are certainly the most important of this trio to cover before next week, so I saved the best for last. We've talked about William and Jane Law, as well as William's brother, Wilson, on the podcast before. Back on episode 163, Live and Die by the Law, we discussed them extensively and even got a bit into the controversy that caused them to diverge from the prophet. We talked about them when we discussed Doctrine and Covenants section 132, the polygamy revelation, we discussed when jo- Joseph Smith called William Law a Brutus or Judas among the ranks. We've discussed the laws extensively. Today, however, we're really going to get into the nitty gritty of what happened and how the laws came to be the tip of the descent spear which crippled the prophet and brought an end to his reign in 1844. First, a little review of the background for the Law family. William and Wilson Law immigrated to Pennsylvania from their homeland of Ireland sometime before 1820 with their parents, Richard Law and Anne Hunter Law. The Law family moved to today's Ontario, Canada by 1833. Here is where William Law met Jane Silverthorne, and they were married in June of 1833. William was 24 years old, Wilson was 27, and Wilson remained unmarried until the 1840s. William and Jane, as well as Wilson Law, all converted to the church sometime around in 1837, when it was turmoil during the late Kirtland era of the church. The Laws, however, did not immigrate to Kirtland or even to Missouri after Joe and the Quorum of Apostles were removed from the Kirtland leadership and they moved the church headquarters to Missouri. During this time, William Law was presiding elder of the Churchville branch of the church and his duties and time were occupied with his leadership role in Canada. The Laws remained in Canada for the entire Missouri-Mormon War of 1838. Once the leadership had been arrested and then escaped from Liberty Jail and the Mormons were beginning to settle in Illinois, the laws decided to pull the trigger and moved to commerce, which would soon become Nauvoo. This move was the result of a consolidation effort the leadership was making to bring as many people to Nauvoo as possible. Previous revelations had been given to spread out and to try and diversify the church among different localities, but Joe had learned an important lesson when he was forced to excommunicate the Missouri leadership to retain control in early 1838. When the people are all grouped together, it's much easier to keep an eye on everybody and to keep them under the thumb of the leadership of the one true prophet. In accordance with this consolidation efforts of the church, the laws moved to commerce in late 1839. The Mormons began resettling, and Joseph collected affidavits from hundreds of Mormons about their experience in Missouri. He took that folder of documents and presented it to Congress and to President Martin Van Buren. During his trip to Washington, D.C., this was when Joseph Smith and William Law met up in Springville. And while the laws were headed west to, um, you know, Nauvoo, commerce, it wasn't Nauvoo yet, and the prophet's posse was headed east towards D.C., that's where they met near Springfield, Illinois, and they tarried there a few days together. Here, Joseph and William Law cultivated the beginnings of a deep friendship, which would eventually lead to William Law being called as second counselor to the prophet, once Frederick G. Williams died and Hiram had become a patriarch of the church to replace his deceased father, Joseph Sr., or Big Daddy Cheese as we know him. William Law showed great promise in the church upon his arrival to commerce. His older brother, Wilson, tended to be a bit less involved in the church, and for that reason we're going to be focusing a lot more on William and Jane Law today than we will Wilson Law. 
So accordingly, the monumental revelation, which became Doctrine and Covenants section 124 in today's scriptures, was produced in conjunction with the passage of the Nauvoo Charter by John C. Recca Bennett. We've talked about DNC 124 a lot on the show, but essentially it was the religious component of establishing uh, Nauvoo while the Nauvoo City Charter being passed through the Illinois legislature was the secular component. DNC 124 being published when Nauvoo was officially recognized as a city ensured a constant and indivisible intermingling of church and secular municipal authority. William Law is named repeatedly in Doctrine and Covenants section 124. Verse 82 commanded William Law by name to purchase stock in the Nauvoo House Association, which we've also discussed extensively on the show, but that was basically what Joe conceived of to become the Mormon Ritz in Nauvoo. Fifteen verses later in DNC 124, it reads as follows. Let my servant William Law also receive the keys by which he may ask and receive blessings. Let him be humble before me and be without guile, and he shall receive of my spirit, even the comforter, which shall manifest unto him the truth of all things, and shall give him in the very hour what he shall say. End quote. And later in verse 107, it reads, let him assist my servant Joseph, and also let my servant William Law assist my servant Joseph in making a solemn proclamation unto the kings of the earth, even as I have before said unto you. And then finally, in verse 126, William Law is called to an important office, quote, I give unto him, meaning Joseph, four counselors, my servant Sidney Rigdon and my servant William Law that these may constitute a quorum and first presidency to receive the oracles for the whole church, end quote. This placed William Law on a level of church authority equivalent with Hinchpin Sidney Rigdon. William Law was in as exclusive of circles as he could be during the earliest days of Nauvoo being Nauvoo instead of commerce. William Law was also responsible for one of the public works projects in Nauvoo that was actually completed, one of the very few. He was put in charge of the grain and sawmill that was built in the city, which made him quite wealthy. What is interesting about this grain and sawmill is that it was initially slated to be driven by water power when the the Nauvoo Canal Project was completed. The canal project would have diverted a small amount of water from the Mississippi through the center of Nauvoo's mercantile district, thus providing endless source of power for the planned factories that were going to be built there. However, the canal project was conceived and agreed upon, but never got more than a few dozen feet dug before the whole project was abandoned. Instead, a steam power motor was purchased and brought to Nauvoo and was hooked up to the grain and sawmill so the Mormons could cut their trees into boards and to grind their grain into flour. The grain and sawmill project was conceived in early 1841, but it actually wasn't tabled for completion until early 1842 where Joe's Nauvoo Journal records that on Monday, January 24th, he met with William Law to inspect the lots designated for that mill. On the same day, Joe and Emma signed a deed to William Law for $700 for the lots, and the land was officially transferred to William Law, with Joe's younger brother Samuel H. Smith acting as Justice of the Peace in order to notarize their signatures. William Law was also called as a registrar of the University of Nauvoo. And of course, the University of Nauvoo, just to review, it was sanctioned by the Nauvoo Charter, but it was never really formally created beyond forming kind of a basic curriculum with a few standard textbooks. Whatever the intention of the University of Nauvoo was at its inception, the benefits reaped from its existence only really amounted to just granting honorary degrees to people who did favors for the Mormons. Well, William Law was the guy who handled the student records of the university. He alone approved of people joining the university and their records and handled their records while they were students there. So if a guy like, let's say, James Gordon Bennett was printing some great articles about the Mormons in his newspaper, the New York Herald, William Law was the guy who accepted and processed the paperwork that gave James Gordon Bennett his honorary Juris Doctorate degree, even though that guy never actually went through law school, much less through the University of Nauvoo's law school pro program. It, it didn't even have a law school program. But this power granted law the ability to scratch the back of anybody who corruptly scratched the collective back of the Mormons, and the powers were exercised in a few notable cases like James Gordon Bennett's. William Law was also appointed to a criminal justice committee that was formed in October of 1840 as a result of the general conference that first Sunday. 
as was required by the Nauvoo Charter, every act or ordinance that was passed in the city had to be published in the city newspaper immediately before it could take effect. The leadership bent this rule from time to time, but for the most part, they actually stuck with it and published it through the church's periodical, The Times of Seasons. Accordingly, printed in the first October of 1840 periodical of The Times of Seasons, we find the minutes from the conference, which include this, quote, The president, Joseph Smith, arose and stated that there had been several depredations committed on the citizens of Nauvoo and thought it expedient that a committee be appointed to search out the offenders and bring them to justice. Whereupon it was resolved that Joseph Smith, William Marks, Elias Higby, there's a Higby name in there, Vincent Knight, Charles C. Rich, Dimmick B. Huntington, and William Law compose said committee, end quote. So this committee was formed when the general topic of discussion during the conference was criminal justice, because Nauvoo didn't have a police force yet. In the same meeting, John C. Reckett Bennett spoke on the necessity of the brethren to, quote, stand by each other and resist every unlawful attempt at persecution, end quote. <laughs> of course, meaning people who are coming in to arrest Joseph Smith, right? Bennett also added later in that same meeting that, quote, many persons had been accused of crime and had been looked upon as guilty when on investigation it had been ascertained that nothing could be adduced against them, end quote. You see, criminality in Nauvoo was a constant issue that could never be controlled, but Bennett attempted to instate some form of checks and balances within the criminal underground in Nauvoo by proposing a motion, quote, It was resolved that no person be considered guilty of crime unless proved so by the testimony of two or three witnesses, end quote. So what this resulted in was a conflict for William Law. And what I mean by that is he was a generally a good person and regarded in his life after Mormonism as a moral guy. However, the Nauvoo criminal justice system covered up a lot of crime. And we've talked about this a lot on the show as well. Witnesses could be produced to reach all sorts of outcomes when those outcomes were beneficial to the leadership of the church. William Law saw first person how the Nauvoo municipal court system was abused so much by the leadership and it devolved into a banana republic court system to protect those in power and allow crime to propagate unmitigated. When it came to squashing dissent, the high council and the ecclesiastical punishment coupled with the Nauvoo municipal system allowed for complete and total character assassination. We saw that very thing happen last week with Chauncey Higby when he was caught up in the Bennett expose scandal when he was punished by the high council and brought into the Nauvoo court for adultery charges. Two components ruled by the same people, the ecclesiastical authority and the secular city authority. It was the same group of guys running that system. William Law was present as a member of the criminal justice committee that was formed in Nauvoo. So to what extent he approved of these tyrannical powers or he just remained silent and watched them pass by, that's a matter of mystery that Law took with him to the grave. However, he did begin to show signs of dissent starting to grow, resulting from polygamy. Now, all evidence leads historians to conclude that William and Jane Law were diehard monogamists. So, when Bennett began collecting data about polygamy, it caused the laws to ideologically divorce themselves from the inner circles of church leadership that was trending in secret toward polygamy. Publicly, however, William Law made numerous statements defending Joseph Smith against the allegations that Bennett made and even embarked on a mission to the eastern states to set issues in order and to preach the propaganda that the church of leadership uh, the, the church of leadership had contrived to damage control the Bennett meltdown and all of the spiritual wife allegations that he was making. It can't be overstated how divisive of an issue polygamy was in Nauvoo. Joseph Smith pushed his two counselors away as a result of polygamy when he made a mark of Sidney Rigdon's daughter, Nancy, and when he attempted to prey on William's wife, Jane, Joe turned both of them into enemies. Rigdon and Joe reconciled. The laws and Joe, however, did not, and the chasm between them grew from mid-1843 into early 1844. Mid-1842 and the Bennett meltdown seemed to be where William and Wilson Law sort of diverged, right? So Wilson Law grew further away from the church than William. Now, 
I sincerely believe that in 1842, William Law wanted to believe the allegations made by John Bennett were false. It's worth taking stock of why he harbored that cognitive dissonance, right? Everything that the laws had in life, including all of their social connections, all of their personal wealth, all of their friends, all of their entire support system, all of that was tied up in Nauvoo. I think that the laws sincerely believed they were following the right religion, as will be evidenced by the end of today's episode, but that Joe was a man with human failings. The fact that the laws had so much tied up in Nauvoo likely put them in a place where they were uncomfortable with thinking about the church and its leadership critically. It's it's like when I talk to my parents about the church hoarding $124 billion today, and they're using that money to silence victims of sex abuse by church leadership. They... My parents have devoted their entire lives to the church. Everything they know is tied to the church. Every connection they have with any other human is almost exclusively within the context of the church, whether those people are neighbors that my parents see every Sunday or there are other people living in a community of really high percentage of members, right? Every interaction that they have, they assume the chances are pretty good that the person they're talking to are members of the church. So the church for my parents represents everything good in their life. It's because of the church that they enjoy so many things in life. Examining the system that has made their life so good through a critical lens is impossible without inspiring and creating cognitive dissonance. They can't question the church because that calls into question everything to which they've devoted their entire lives. I believe that William and Jade Law were in this same boat in 1842. They had completely given up everything they knew in Canada in order to move to the Mormon settlement on the Mississippi. When they arrived in Nauvoo with a train of wagons carrying supplies, the group of people who received them were sick. They were destitute. They were traumatized. The friendships that the laws forged upon their arrival in Quincy and Commerce in summer of 1839 were friendships that none of us could ever truly understand. Why, then, did Joe call William Law to the second highest position of church leadership? That's a deeper question that I don't think could be answered. Did Joe find that William Law, at age 30, was a motivated and ambitious person who would give everything he had to the church? Was Joseph maybe attracted to Jane at the time and called William to the presidency to get as close as possible to one of his marks? Maybe those are too simplistic of speculations. Maybe Joe saw someone who was truly devoted and was smart enough to be effective with whatever task he was given. Maybe William and Joe became fast friends the way that Joe did with many people. And the connection that Joe and William shared, in addition to the friendship that Jane Law and Emma shared, maybe it was just simply good chemistry. We can't ever know why Joe made that decision to call William Law to the presidency. All we can do is speculate as to why somebody who was a relative newcomer to the Mormon movement was given a position equal with Sidney Rigdon, who had been there since the beginning. Now, where Wilson Law was in all of this is a matter of question. He simply doesn't have as many documents in church archives with his name on them, and Wilson occupied a much less prominent position in church leadership. Therefore, we have to continue to focus more heavily on William and Jane Law and merely speculate about Wilson kind of as we go. During William Law's time in high-ranking offices within the church, Nauvoo government, and the Nauvoo Legion— he was highly favored by the prophet. I mean, while Joe was hiding to escape arrest, he recorded in August 1842 a series of visions that he had received. And when I say visions, the dreams is probably a better word for what's recorded, um, or maybe hallucinations or whatever you want to call it. But anyway, in this in this in these journal entries, he talks about uh, his loved family, his wife Emma, and how quote many were the reverberations of my mind when I contemplated for a moment the many scenes we had been called to pass through, the fatigues, the toils, the sorrows and sufferings, yet. Emma is here undaunted, firm, and unwavering, unchangeable, affectionate Emma, end quote. Then he saw in another vision his brother Hiram, a natural brother with a faithful heart. 
When he received these visions, Joe was actually on a, the, uh, the small island in between Montrose on the Iowa side of the Mississippi and Nauvoo on the other side of the Mississippi. And at this time, a group of the most highly trusted Mormon elites, the who's who of ultimate Mormons in 1842, visited the prophet in this little rat hole hide away from the view of the constables who were in Nauvoo waiting to capture Joseph Smith and take him to Missouri. Whatever happened that night is reflected fondly in Joe's reminiscences, but he wasn't kind enough or, let's say, graphic enough to leave behind any description. This is all he said, quote, My heart was overjoyed as I took the faithful band by hand that stood upon the shore one by one. William Law, William Clayton, Dimmick B. Huntington, George Miller were there. The above names constituted the little group. I do not think to mention the particulars of the history of that sacred night, which shall forever be remembered by me. But the names of the faithful are what I wish to record in this place. These I have met in prosperity, and they were my friends. I now meet them in adversity, and they are still my warmer friends. End quote. Something happened, though. 1841, William Law and Joe were such good friends that Joe called him to be a counselor in the church presidency. 1842, Joe considered him to be one of his warmest friends who met him in his time of need when Joe was hiding from the law. William Law, on the other hand, was beginning to falter in his loyalty to the prophet. In late 1843, William Law began to openly subvert public declarations by Joe about the, who the Mormons should vote for. The 1843 election was a divisive issue among church members. Joe had promised his vote to a guy named Cyrus Walker because Walker agreed to defend Joseph Smith in court when Joseph was arrested by Sheriffs Reynolds and Wilson with an order to convey him to Missouri to answer for his crimes in 1838, as well as the assassination attempt on Lilburn Boggs. We've talked about this on the show quite a bit as well. When it came time for the election, Joe promised that he would vote for Cyrus Walker, but the problem was Walker was a Whig who couldn't promise the Mormons what the Democrat candidate Hoge could. So Joe pulled a fast one, and the day of the election, Joe called a public meeting to give the Mormons in Nauvoo a sermon. This is what Joseph says, quote, Brother Hiram tells me this morning that he has had a testimony to the effect it would be better for the people to vote for Hoge. And I never knew Hiram to say he ever had a revelation, and it failed. I, all, I authorize all men to say I am a personal friend of Governor Ford. End quote. The meeting wasn't over just yet. After Joe stepped down from the podium, Hiram's sidekick Abiff Smith took the stand and expounded on the revelation that Joe had alluded to. No record survives of what he said specifically, unfortunately. But after Hiram finished, William Law took the stand in an epic display of insubordination to Joseph Smith and the church. This is from Governor Thomas Ford's History of Illinois. Quote, William Law, another great leader of the Mormons, next appeared and denied that the Lord had made any such revelation. He stated that to his certain knowledge, the prophet uh, Joseph was in favor of Mr. Walker and that the prophet was more likely to know the mind of the Lord on the subject than the patriarch. End quote. Hiram took the stand again to respond to what William Law had just said about Joe being in favor of Cyrus Walker and, quote, repeated his revelation with greater tone of authority, end quote. So to kind of review, Cyrus Walker was the Whig candidate Joseph Smith had promised that he would vote for, implying the Mormon vote would go towards Cyrus Walker if Cyrus Walker abandoned his campaign trail in order to defend Joseph Smith in the legal court system after Joseph Smith was arrested. Cyrus Walker agreed with the understanding that he was going to get the Mormon voting bloc. However, the Democrats could promise more than the Whigs could, and Governor Thomas Ford, who had just been elected in 1843, was a Democrat governor of Illinois. So Joseph Smith said Hiram Smith uh, received a revelation and that the people should vote with the revelation instead of with who Joseph Smith is going to vote for. It was a very divisive time. Joe took the stand to clear the air. Quote, 
Joe Smith there stated that he himself was in favor of Mr. Walker and intended to vote for him, that he would not, if he could, influence any voter in giving his vote, that he considered it a mean business for him or any other man to attempt to dictate to the people who they should support in elections, that he had heard his brother Hiram had received a revelation from the Lord on the subject. Brother Hiram is a man of truth. He had known Brother Hiram intimately ever since he was a boy, and he had never known to tell no had never known him to tell a lie. If Brother Hiram said he had received such a revelation, he had no doubt it was a fact. When the Lord speaks, let all the earth be silent, end quote. Now, to wrap this all together, from the history of Hancock County, written by Thomas Gregg, circa 1880, quote, That settled it. The election occurred on the next day. It is believed the prophet did, with a few others, vote for Walker in the face of the revelation, but the body of his followers voted for Hoge, giving him 2,088 votes to Walker's 733 in the county and beating him in the district by 455 votes. This change of position at Nauvoo was not known in Adams County till after the election, so Mr. O.H. Browning, the Whig candidate in that district, received the Mormon vote there. End quote. So if William Law was experiencing cognitive dissonance before the election because there's too much politics and too much other non-church related affairs going on by the church leadership, this must have certainly spiked those dark cognitive dissonant feelings. Now, like I said, like William Law, the Law family, they'd given their whole lives to the church and William obviously believed that the church was true, but what he saw was a grand display of Joe abusing the pulpit to get political favors, which has always been a very sticky issue in American politics. William Law taking the stand and telling the people to ignore Hiram's revelation and vote with the prophet, I think that's quite revealing. Joe and Hiram had orchestrated this little vote swap before they took the stand that day. William Law taking the stand and telling the people to ignore Hiram's revelation threw a wrench into Joe and Hiram's plan to get the Democrat elected. Oh, to see the anxious looks that were exchanged between Joe and Hiram as William Law was preaching against their little scheme. Oh, to be a fly on a flower petal watching that public demonstration. But this election sermon and the outcome of the votes being cast evidences when William Law really took a sharp turn away from the Nauvoo leadership here in late 1843. And beyond that, rumors of polygamy were growing out of control, even though the Bennett meltdown had been weathered. Two friends of William and Jane Law from their time in Canada had been married to Joseph while he was their guardian. That's Sarah and Maria Lawrence. Both of them were, you know, teenage sisters. Polygamy was, in many ways for William Law, just a symptom of the problems arising with the clandestine activities of Joseph Smith. In exploration of William Law's reasons for turning defector, historian Lyndon Cook published an article titled William Law Nauvoo Dissenter in the winter 1982 edition of the BYU Studies Journal. In it, Cook cites five primary reasons for William Law's dissent. Quote, According to his own statements, William Law turned against the Mormon prophet because of William's perception that, number one, Joseph was totally ungovernable and defiant and was determined to obey or disobey the law of the land at his convenience, i.e. a claim to higher law. Number two, Joseph united church and state, both as mayor of Nauvoo and as an influential religious leader by manipulating or seeking to manipulate politicians for private purposes, i.e. breakdown of the rule of law. Number three, Joseph had allowed the established judicial order of the church government to be trampled underfoot. Number four, Joseph had attempted to control the temporal or financial interests of the Mormon people by ecclesiastical authority. And number five, more importantly, Joseph had corrupted the church by introducing false and damnable doctrines such as plurality of gods, a plurality of wives, and the doctrine of unconditional sealing up unto eternal life, i.e. Joseph Smith was a fallen prophet, end quote. In view of these rising tensions beginning to really show through in late 1843, Joseph Smith and William Law slowly became enemies. Joseph could sense that William Law was a major problem, and he'd recently been through the ringer by one of his previous closest advisors, John C. Reckett Bennett. 
Joe was determined to not make the same mistakes with William Law that he made with Bennett. Any person of Law's rank defecting from the church, just like with Bennett, posed a significant threat to the prophet and to his inner circle. Notably, William Law, in an interview taken for a Mormon expose that was published in 1885, Law discussed his and Jane's reaction to learning about, about plural marriage. Quote, Hiram gave it, meaning what became Doctrine and Covenants section 132, to me and told me to take it home and read it, and then be careful with it and bring it back again. Jane and I were just turned upside down by it. We did not know what to do. End quote. This confusion turned to resolve as 1843 turned into 1844. Early 1844, marked a new year with new rising tensions between William Law and Joseph Smith. Caught in the mix was Jane Law. Now, the exact details of what occurred here and the timing of it are really hard to nail down. It also doesn't help that the historical record is clouded with conjecture and with public denials that anything occurred between Jane Law and Joseph Smith. We discussed this back on our episodes going through Doctrine and Covenants 132, the polygamy revelation, but there is some evidence to conclude that Emma wanted William Law for a spiritual husband, possibly in exchange for Joseph taking Jane Law as a spiritual wife. Whether or not this actually happened, the public consensus was that it did happen, largely aided by an expose written by Joseph H. Jackson and published in the Warsaw Signal. Quote, he had frequently heard of the spiritual wife doctrine from the Gentiles, but he, not having heard such doctrine taught by Smith, set it down as slanderous persecution against the church. He's talking about William Law here. When, however, this new revelation was made known to him, his eyes were opened, and at once he indignantly rejected the doctrines as not of God, but of the devil. Such was his vehemence and indignation that it became apparent to Joe that he had presumed too much on Law's faith and that it would be idle to attempt to stuff him with the doctrine. There was no alternative, therefore, for Joe, but to destroy Law's influence, and therefore a great bustle was re raised and Law cut off from the holy order. This placed Law, who was particularly sensitive, in an awful dilemma, and so powerfully did the frequent lectures he received work upon his nerves that I entertained serious apprehensions that he would become crazed. Quick note. Joseph H. Jackson and William Law were pretty good friends when Joseph Jackson was compiling the information for this expose to be published in the Warsaw Signal. He saw the inner conversations that were happening between himself and William Law. He understood what was going on. He could see the devolution of William Law as Joseph continued to make public and private statements and rants against William Law. Joseph H. Jackson continues... One Sunday morning, Joe and I had a long talk concerning William Law, in which he avowed, not for the first time, however, his determination to put Law out of the way, for he had become dangerous to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and that it was the will of God that he should be removed. He, however, wished to proceed in such a manner that he would be able to get Law's wife, end quote. Then Jackson's expose goes on to detail how Joe set up the Nauvoo City Police on night watch in order to catch William Law with his guard down. But unfortunately for Joseph Smith, it didn't work. Law was able to avert their assassination attempt. Then Jackson goes on to say this, quote, Not only was his design to remove William Law, but also William Marks. The spite he had against the latter arose from the fact that he had endeavored to seduce the daughter of Marx, and she had informed her parents, who were very wrathy, and Joe dreaded their influence. Kind of like what happened with Sidney Rigdon and uh, Nancy. For this reason, he said that those individuals, if they were not checked, would ruin the church. William Wilson Law, having heard by the vague information they had received that either one of them or Marx was the Judas whom Joe sought, armed themselves and went to Joe's house. On seeing them, Joe became desperately alarmed and gave every evidence of his apprehensions. They had a long conversation, in the course of which Joe made some abusive remark, which so exasperated Wilson Law that he drew his pistol and made Joe swallow his words in a hurry. So great was the excitement that it was with difficulty that William Law and Hiram Smith could prevent Wilson from firing. So not only did 
Charles A. Foster pull a pistol on Joseph Smith, but also Wilson Law did, according to Joseph H. Jackson. Jackson continues, quote, Joe, seeing his plans foiled, determined on making capital of the whole affair by raising the cry of persecution. Accordingly, he called the city council together, and in order to show the public that there was no ground for the rumors that had been afloat concerning his plot against law, he brought all the 40 guards up and questioned every man whether he had ever bound them by a secret oath. Every man appeared perfectly amazed, and not one had ever known of any such thing, nor did they know anything about the conspiracy against Law and Marx. This is part of Joe's game. Whenever he is accused of secret plots, he calls his men who are instructed to appear as foolish as possible to disprove the accusation. In this instance, they endeavored so hard to appear silly that a sensible man might have detected the trick, but... The faithful were convinced that Joe had been vilely persecuted and slandered and that there was no ground whatever for the accusation against him, end quote. Joseph Jackson's expose was written retrospectively from the events of early to mid-1844 and after Joseph and Hiram Smith had died in Carthage. Jackson leaves out or only alludes to really uh, some really important details here. When Joe had considered William Law to be enough of a threat, Joe removed him from the presidency of the church in January of 1844. Well, William Law like resigned from the presidency on January 8th, but I, it's kind of hard to tell what happened here. To what extent his resignation was actually coerced by Joseph Smith, that's kind of a subject that reasonable historians can disagree about. According to William Law's son, Richard Law, William confronted Joseph Smith about polygamy in early 1844, quote, with his arms around the neck of the prophet, I assume that means choking him, was pleading with him to withdraw the doctrine of plural marriage. William pleaded for this with Joseph with tears streaming from his eyes. The prophet was also in tears, but he informed William that he could not withdraw the doctrine for God had commanded him to teach it. And condemnation would come upon him if he was not obedient to the commandment, end quote. Now, there is, let's just say, there's a disputed document that's only been made available to a few people. Apparently, William Law kept a journal or a diary in Nauvoo for uh, most of 1844, and it provides a window into his inner turmoil about this escalating conflict. Notably, however, is that this journal in question, it's not in church archives. So Lyndon Cook, who we read an excerpt from his uh, article, his 1982 article, which we're going to read a little bit more from, and of course you'll find it in the show notes, but Lyndon Cook was apparently granted access to William Law's journal in order to write that 1982 BYU Studies article about William Law. And also Leonard Arrington in his journal, who Leonard Arrington was the official church historian beginning in the late 1970s, Leonard Arrington shared correspondence with the claimed custodian of that document, of that journal, right, who is actually a descendant of William Law. The person who held the journal in 1978 was apparently, according to Leonard Arrington, a recent convert who told Arrington that her husband didn't want the church getting a hold of the William Law Journal and various letters written by William Law. Ultimately, it's unknown where the journal currently is. Is We know in 1982, if it's a legitimate artifact, it was in private collections. We don't know where it is now. Maybe the church successfully acquired it from the law family descendants. Maybe it remains in the family. Maybe the journal is a fabrication to begin with. We just don't know, and historians don't have access to the document in order to verify its pedigree or authenticity. However, Lyndon Cook's article prints a number of extracts from this claimed William Law journal without providing photographs or holographic transcriptions of the document. So, here is a brief excerpt from that article containing William Law's journal entry for the day that he was released or that he resigned or whatever from the church presidency. So once again, this is a disputed artifact in Mormon history in a private archive that other historians have not had access to. So take it with a grain of salt. This is what Lyndon Cook says, quote, 
William was further informed on 8th January 1844 that his rebellion had resulted in his being excluded from the anointed quorum and dropped from the first presidency. While William considered these actions as unjust and dishonorable, he believed that his dismissal had released him from a compromising position. Now, quoting from the William Law Journal, supposedly, I feel relieved from a most embarrassing situation. I cannot fellowship the abominations which I verily know are practiced by this man. Consequently, I am glad to be free from him. End quote. Once again, that document that Lyndon Cook just quoted from is disputed. And historian Ben Park wrote a blog post back in 2017 calling the veracity of that journal into question. However, it actually isn't unreasonable to think that William Law would have started keeping this journal when he was beginning to calculate his removal from the church and he felt like his life was threatened, right? That's a good piece for a surviving spouse to have. That's a good piece of evidence, a personal journal for a surviving spouse to have if their spouse goes missing, right? William Law's resignation or his removal, him being dropped from the presidency and the anointed quorums, those were milestones towards his expose and apostasy from the church under Joe's leadership. This resignation event marks a hard turn away from the church leadership, and it may be the marker by which we can judge Joe coming on to Jane Law. Now, it may have been that William had learned of Joe's advances on Jane in early January, and that's when he resigned in protest. Uh, it's hard to tell when the the issue with Jane Law came up. It, it was likely around this time that Joe attempted to orchestrate the assassination of William Law and Wilson Law as well, which William Law corroborates in interviews and letter correspondences in the late 1880s. It's just really hard to know exactly what happened here with, of course, multiple public denials that anything like this ever did happen, right? But beyond that, according to Lyndon Cook reading Law's Nauvoo Journal, William mulled over the doctrine and the teachings of the church for quite some time after he was dropped from the first presidency. Once again, quoting from Lyndon Cook's 1982 BYU Studies article, quote, William seemed willing to be freed from the incubus of polygamy, but it would take time for him to abandon Mormonism altogether. The next few days and weeks provided an opportunity for deep reflection. His diary reveals that he was racked with self-doubt, and he realized that the cardinal underpinnings of his faith in Mormonism were being wrecked. On 13th January 1844, he bewailed his awful condition. Now quoting from the journal, quote, What my feelings have been... I cannot relate. Various and painful at times, almost beyond endurance. A thousand recollections burst upon my burning brain. The past, the present, and the future. Disappointed hopes. Injured feelings where they should have been held sacred. These things are as poisoned arrows in my bleeding heart. End quote. This time of reflection after his removal from church leadership led to some harsh decisions a few months in the future by William Law. Now, whatever privately occurred between Joe and William Law in January of 1844, Joe publicly and privately considered William and Jane Law to be threats, and he looped them together with others who were threats to his leadership, who we have been discussing extensively in the past few episodes. In the February of 1844 High Council Minutes, Joe said, quote, I know it by the Spirit of the Holy Ghost, there is no man or woman can be saved upon any other principle. He's referring to polygamy. For what we don't save in this probation, we must save them in another. And William Law and Robert D. Foster will never get out of hell until Joseph Smith unlocks it for them. End quote. And in March of 1844, Hiram sidekick Abiff Smith visited William Law in attempt to smooth over the ruffled feathers to no avail. A later visit in April of 1844 from Alman W. Babbitt resulted in the same opposition. What William Law wanted from the leadership was something that Joe and the leadership were not willing to give up. Law wanted the leadership to give up polygamy and the more esoteric practices and doctrines of the church. Law wanted Joe to declare from the pulpit that he had been teaching polygamy and to disavow the practice and to cease it completely. Joseph Smith would never do that, right? 
Thus, the visits from church leaders revealed to William Law that more drastic measures were necessary. On the flip side, Law's repeated refusal to reconcile differences revealed to Joe and the leadership that William Law was too dangerous and something was bound to break. Pressure was building. Who or what would be the fault line? Joe made a bold move. On April 18th, 1844, just a week after the King Follett discourse was given at that month's general conference, the High Council decided to excommunicate both William and Jane Law. In absentia. They weren't even allowed to attend their own excommunication trial. From Linda Cook's 1982 article, quote, The trial of excommunication involved 32 male members. Joseph Smith, Hiram Smith, and Sidney Rigdon were conspicuously absent. And while Church Bishop Newell K. Whitney did participate in the trial, it was Brigham Young, president of the Twelve Apostles, who presided. Because William Law had been dropped from the First Presidency by the Prophet in early January 1844, the court handled the case as if William were a private member. Law argued that such was not the case. He insisted that without being convicted of wrongdoing, he was still a member of the Presidency, and he protested that he could not be summarily excluded from the Church in absentia. William Law learned of his excommunication from William Marks the day after the trial. Law's democratic individualism and Irish passion were registering high marks as he recorded his sentiments in his diary. Once again, his uh, diary that's been disputed by historians. We consider this cutting off as illegal and therefore corrupt. Nettled that he had been excluded from the church without being officially charged or notified, William demanded in writing the name of his accusers, the nature of the indictment, who the witnesses were, and what they proved. The following day, William Law asked Willard Richards, the prophet's clerk, for a transcript of the minutes of the trial, but was informed that there was no record. An entry in Law's diary summarized his evaluation of these actions. By the above, the church has, as a body, transgressed the laws of the church and of God and every principle of justice and are under deep transgression, end quote. It wasn't just William Law, but also Robert D. Bob the Builder Foster, Wilson Law, William's brother, and Jane Law, William's wife, and also a guy named Howard Smith, who were all excommunicated that day, April 18th, 1844. What was William Law to do? He had been removed from the presidency. He and Jane had been excommunicated. The prophet had directed that nobody was able to transact any business with the laws in order to starve them out. The main problem here is William Law believed that the church was true, but that Joseph Smith was a fallen prophet in addition to being an unlawful tyrant. So what could William Law do under these circumstances? The only thing that came to his mind, apparently, was to save the gospel from the despot who had sullied it. Ten days after these people were excommunicated, Joe's journal reads as follows, quote, 28th April, 1844, there was a meeting at General William and Wilson Laws near the sawmill of those who had been cut off from the church and their dupes. Several affidavits were taken and read against Joseph and others. William Law, Wilson Law, Austin D. Cowles, John Scott Sr., Francis M. Higby, Dr. Robert D. Foster, and Robert Pierce were appointed a committee to visit the different families of the city and see who would join the new church. It was decided that Joseph was fallen prophet, etc., and William Law was appointed in his place. William Law was appointed in his place. William Law was appointed in Joseph Smith's place. Austin Cowles and Wilson Law counselors, Robert D. Foster and Francis M. Higby to the Twelve Apostles, etc., as report says... James Blakely preached up Joseph Smith in the AM and PM and joined the Antis, Charles Ivins as bishop, end quote. 
on April 28th, 1844, William Law formed a new Mormon religion and was appointed the new prophet, seer, and revelator of it. This newly formed church was called, (laughs) are you ready for it? The true church (laughs) of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. (laughs) Real original there, Bill. (laughs) So not only was, was a new church with the same name, only with true in front of it, formed right under the thumb of the prophet, they also appointed a new quorum of apostles, a new bishop, and William Law appointed counselors in Austin Cowles and in his brother, Wilson Law. In addition to organizing this, let's call it what it is, a market competitor, the primary purpose of this meeting was to allow an open space for those frustrated or disenchanted or altogether infuriated by the wrongs that they had suffered by the Nauvoo government and church leadership because those were run by the same people. It was held in order to air out their grievances. A dissenting church being formed in Nauvoo with the express purpose of calling Joe's leadership into question and documenting his behavior by making affidavits. That was the greatest threat the prophet had experienced in his entire ministry. You see, like Joe had dealt with competitor churches organized by people he had been, you know, he had excommunicated before, right? But this was different. His conduct in the past had been excusable by extreme mental plasticity, but what he'd done in Nauvoo, what he'd become in Nauvoo, that was much harder to justify than at any other time in his career. Now, I can imagine it's tough for a demagogue to get a good night's rest. The tossing and the turning from a racing mind must have worn on Joseph Smith just as much as any other tyrant throughout history, right? Joseph lived under a constant threat of exposure for his lying and for his illegal and truly immoral acts, right? Never had that threat been more present than when William Law, who had previously been Joe's left-hand man, formed his own religion in Nauvoo, calling himself a prophet that was formed for the express purpose of banding together the dissenters from Joe's church. This true church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was exactly the mainstream Mormon church that folks would be searching for when they were tired of the constant outrage and scandal coming from Joe's church. It held all of the same teachings as Mormonism of 1841, but it didn't practice the more controversial doctrines of plural wives, of ceilings, of endowments, of the infinite regression of a council of gods, and anything else that other Protestants considered antichrist or anti-biblical. Joe was off the rails. William Law's true church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was a new set of rails to carry these people into mainstream Christianity. What did this new church have planned? What would they do with the affidavits and all the information that they collected from all of the defectors and the people who had been excommunicated from the faith? Well, as we read at the end of the last two episodes about the Fosters and the Higbees, Joe's journal tells us that the threat was imminent and very real. May 7th, 1844, quote, An opposition printing press arrived at Dr. Robert D. Foster's from Columbus, Ohio, as report says, end quote. As soon as this press arrived, Robert D. Bob the Builder Foster set it up and made the first printing of the most consequential printing press in Mormon history, second only to the E.B. Grandin printing press in Palmyra that published the Book of Mormon. The very first thing to roll off of this new opposition printing press. Quote, Prospectus of the Nauvoo Expositor. 
The expositor will be devoted to a general diffusion of useful knowledge, and its columns open for the admission of all courteous communications of religious, moral, social, literary, or political character without taking a decided stand in favor of either of the great political parties of the country. A part of its columns will be devoted to a few primary objects which the publishers deem of vital importance to the public welfare. Now, the way that this is printed, they bold certain letters, they capitalize certain letters, they italicize certain letters. I'm going to read this the way that I feel like William Law was actually writing it before he sent it to Robert Foster to be printed. I am going to do this a... I'm going to try and do a dramatic reading in the way that I feel like William Law wrote this. Let's do it. Their particular locality gives them a knowledge of the many gross abuses exercised under the pretended authorities of the charter of the city of Nauvoo by the legislative authorities of said city and the insupportable oppressions of the ministerial powers in carrying out the unjust, illegal, and unconstitutional ordinances of the same. The publishers, therefore, deem it a sacred duty they owe to their country and their fellow citizens to advocate through the columns of the exposition the unconditional repeal of the Nauvoo City Charter, to restrain and correct the abuses of the unit power, to ward off the iron rod which is held over the devoted heads of the citizens of Nauvoo and the surrounding country, to advocate unmitigated disobedience to political revelations and to censure and decry gross moral imperfections wherever found, either in the plebeian, patrician, or self-constituted monarch, to advocate the pure principles of morality, the pure principles of truth, designed not to destroy but to strengthen the mainspring of God's moral government, to advocate and exercise the freedom of speech in Nauvoo, independent of the ordinances abridging the same, to give free toleration to every man's religious sentiments and sustain all in worshiping their God according to the monitions of their consciences, as guaranteed by the constitution of our country, and to oppose with uncompromising hostility any union of church and state, or any preliminary step tending to the same, to sustain all, however humble, in their equal and constitutional rights, and oppose the sacrifice of the liberty, the property, and the happiness of the many to the pride and ambition of the few. In a word, to give a full, candid, and succinct statement of facts as they really exist in the city of Nauvoo, fearless of whose particular case the facts may apply, being governed by the laws of editorial courtesy and the inherent dignity which is inseparable from honorable minds, at the same time exercising their own judgment in cases of flagrant abuses or moral delinquencies." to use such terms and names as they deem proper when the object is of such high importance that the end will justify the means. In this great and indispensable work, we confidently look to an enlightened public to aid us in our laudable effort. The first number of the Expositor will be issued on Friday, the 7th day of June, 1844. Publishers, William Law, Wilson Law, Charles Ivins, Francis M. Higby, Chauncey L. Higby, Robert D. Foster, Charles A. Foster. End quote. I want to uh, share something with you, listeners. There's a very specific shirt in my dresser that I really like to wear. It's one of my very few pieces of wardrobe that I actually love. I love this shirt. I got this shirt back in October 2018 from a very special place. 
Annie and I spent a month in Europe, and one of the first stops that we made was Lutestadt Wittenberg. This is the town in which Martin Luther published his translation of the Bible, first of the New Testament in 1522, and then of the complete Bible with Apocrypha in 1534. According to legend, this Wittenberg chapel is also where Luther nailed his 95 Thesis to the door of this Catholic chapel. Now, I know this story is disputed, right? But legends usually are, even if they do happen to contain little kernels of truth. Wittenberg has changed hands a few times since Martin Luther and Philip Melanchthon spent years translating the Bible. Not from the Latin Vulgate, but from the Greek and the Hebrew, using as original a sources as they had access to. Today, the town in Germany is a tourist destination, and for many, it's viewed as a Protestant pilgrimage, almost like a holy land. It's a, it's, it's a beautiful city, and I couldn't help but buy a t-shirt from one of the local shops with Martin Luther on it. Now, what's cool about this shirt is Martin Luther isn't recognizable to anybody other than religious history junkies like yours truly, so whenever somebody asks me, who is that on my shirt... I respond with, he's my spirit animal. Now, I know that most people's spirit animal isn't a human. Maybe it's an eagle. Maybe it's a fox. Or maybe if you're like Annie, your spirit animal is a sloth, right? That's her spirit animal. But humans are animals, and Martin Luther is my spirit animal. Martin Luther crippled a millennium-long theocratic empire with nothing more than information. He took information that was exclusive and tightly controlled and gave that information to the people in a way that they could understand. That information was claimed to be the literal word of God and Catholicism had leveraged that exclusivity to establish and maintain a theocracy larger and more powerful and more wealthy than nearly any other empire humanity has ever seen. You see, no sword, no chariot, no horse archer could legitimately threaten the complete and total power of Catholicism for over a thousand years. One person comes along with one book and strikes a fatal blow. Owing to the power of the printing press, the German translation of the Bible from those original languages, it could finally be purchased by anybody. And it wasn't long before every Catholic bishop was on an even battlefield with anybody else who was literate. They now had equal access to the claimed word of God. Everybody could access information equally. No longer was Catholicism the only available middleman between people and their deity. Rampant corruption caused by indulgences feeding this Catholic empire monster were brought into question because there was no biblical defense for the practice. Just by publishing information via the printing press, an overwhelming and absolute empire around which society had been constructed was rendered a vestigial cancer. The power of the printing press has never been truly quantified. The democratization of information and rapidly increased literacy rates have been the building blocks of society as we know it since the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment itself wouldn't have happened without the printing press. Medicine, geology, all of the science, music, theater, all of the arts, novels, textbooks, all of the quantitative knowledge of humanity, none of these things would be what they are today without the printing press. Everything we enjoy in society is because of the printing press. It is a tool of unmatched impact and power. A printing press made Joseph Smith who he was. It started with the E.B. Grandin press in Palmyra printing 5,000 copies of the Book of Mormon. After that, a printing press was never far from Joe's hand. The Evening and the Morning Star, The Messenger and Advocate, The Elder's Journal, The Millennial Star, The Times and Season, The Gospel Reflector, The Wasp, The Nauvoo Neighbor, all of these printing presses worked to build the Mormon Empire. 
The information produced by these printing presses continually elevated Joseph Smith to a higher and higher and higher lattice of religious power. But the higher the tower, the harder it falls. What these seven publishers proved to us is that no matter how powerful an empire becomes, it is always vulnerable to truth. Yes, a printing press placed Joseph Smith in the public light. It gained him a following. It made him obscenely wealthy and provided for him a fast and hard lifestyle that few people ever get to enjoy. But another printing press would bookend his public life as prophet, seer, and revelator. The pen is mightier than the sword, and a printing press does the work of a thousand pens every minute. One doesn't end an empire by force. The only true end to any tyrannical reign is infection. You can't hit this thing head on, so you make it sick and you weaken it from within. The Nauvoo Expositor and the infection caused by its seven publishers would prove to be the fatal blow that Joseph Smith's empire couldn't overcome. That's going to do it for episode 199, Big 200, next week. I hope you all are ready for what we have in store. But let's go ahead and wrap up this episode. I got an email from Logan here, and I wanted to respond to this on air. It's kind of a long message, but it's uh, going back quite a few episodes. And there's there's just a couple of issues that I want to deal with here. The uh, It's uh, concerning episodes 174 and 75 uh, that we had on Philippa Meek to talk about modern day polygamy. And this is what Logan says. Hello, I'm still behind. So sorry for resurrecting an old episode, but I had some serious problems with this episode, not with things you said. You try to keep the perspective in reality because of the gender dynamics and doctrine of the church. I feel like Philippa was uh, too, or focused too much on the social justice aspect of being liberal in a person's choice in marriage and ignoring the inherent psychological effect of a doctrine like polygamy being a requirement for a religion. It sounds like she's taking the concept of mixed race marriage and same sex marriage being illegal or frowned upon and extending it to polygamy, but they are not equal situations. The former two were discouraged for obviously flawed concepts of lifestyle, racist or religious concepts where polygamy was being encouraged and required and the act of polygamy was harmful. So I want to begin responding to what Logan said there just briefly by saying we have evolved a society when it comes to what we consider approved of socially acceptable marriage. And at one point it was considered not socially acceptable for a white person to marry a black person. Right. And that was, I mean, that was largely a, I mean, yes, that has racist tendencies uh, that is purely based on race, but those racial prejudices were largely informed by religious concepts. Same thing with gay marriage, same thing. Well, I should say not just gay marriage, but LGBTQ marriage, right? Society dictates that marriage should be one thing. And then the progressive liberal side of society says, wait, why do you have any other reasoning beyond saying your religion, that society should be this way? Maybe we should re-examine this, right? And I think that's the entire point that Philippa is talking about and the the way that she structured her research and presented her research on the podcast on episodes 174 and 75 is the issue of polygamy is a social justice issue at the end of the day because society says marriage has to be one thing. Marriage is one man, one woman. At one point it was one man, one woman who are the same race, right? Um, and taking that to task, saying, why does it have to be that way? Do you have any other reason other than what the Bible says? It's Adam and Eve, not Adam and Eve and Sarah. <laughs> Do you have any other reasoning beyond your religious claims that marriage has to be one man, one woman, or just two people, right? And if there isn't a... a, a if there isn't a secular defense, a secular component to that, then the way that society has it structured is based purely on our religious roots, right? Because there is no disentangling the religious foundations of modern Western society from what we have today, right? So 
Logan goes on to say, in a perfect world, the only requirements for a marriage would be age appropriate, properly consenting adults, and a number of people and their sexes wouldn't factor in at all. I agree. Informed consenting adults, right? From a secular perspective, the purpose of marriage is to satisfy that psychological need for love and companionship. So who and how many shouldn't be considered legally speaking? Then Logan goes on to say, opening the door for religions to implement polygamy as a requirement for salvation and exaltation is a very different situation, though. Um, is it different from the way that religion has dictated monogamy? Because isn't that one of the requirements that, you know, adulterers get the death penalty? And that's why adultery up until relatively recently in some states has been considered a criminal act on uh, on state constitutions. Um, isn't that one of the, the main issues here is that, that one man, one woman marriage is what's required to be approved of in the eyes of God, right? That that's the entire idea behind the concept of one man, one woman monogamy as it currently stands societally speaking. So I don't necessarily see that as a difference in a religion requiring polygamy versus most other religions requiring monogamy for their salvation or for their exaltation. It's just looking at the same issue from different belief perspectives. But Logan goes on to say, make his case further. It is almost the same argument as Islam as the requirement for women to wear specific clothing. A lot of people look down on this because of the obvious sexist slant of the doctrine, but many Islamic women defend it as if they are being, or as they are just being faithful to their religion and it is their choice. And that's, one example of how people who are abused by a system I have like a, a high level Stockholm kind of syndrome and will defend the system that is abusing them. And that, that that's the same case with uh, advocates of polygamy. Um, early Utah history is quite remarkable in that women were some of the most vociferous advocates for polygamy as it was. Um, and why Utah was given its choice or given the ability for women to vote, uh, but was later revoked when women uh, overwhelmingly uh, voted for polygamy to remain the status quo in Utah, right? Uh, the question is, though, if it wasn't a requirement of the religion, would they still feel that way? If they weren't raised and trained their whole life to view that doctrine in that light, would they still feel that way? That is the danger of opening wide the doors of polygamy. Sure, there are men and women that choose that lifestyle on purpose, and it's because there are people that want to live that way that realistically any combination of multiple men, women, and people shouldn't be considered taboo. But... If a person is raised their whole life thinking the only way they can reach true exaltation is by entering into polygamous marriage, regardless of if the doctrine is changed to be more gender neutral and a woman can marry multiple men, is that person making a truly informed and consenting decision? Now, what Logan is doing is opening up the doors of Pandora's box of what we consider informed consenting adults, because the way that religious polygamy is established right now those are very hard concepts to achieve. Can informed consenting adults be informed and consenting within the Mormon context of polygamy? And there's a fair bit of psychological research on exactly this topic. A number of books have been written exactly on this topic. Uh, a lot of people are public advocates saying that that's not possible. And I tend to agree with them because the religion coerces people into not being able to legitimately be informed and legitimately consent, even if they are indeed adults. So I can agree with the sentiment captured in Logan's email here. But once again, we get to the point of as polygamy stands right now, it is not legal. Therefore, the only systems that are that are practicing polygamy are doing so illegally which forces these practices underground. And I believe that was one of the main points that both Philippa and I were discussing extensively on episodes 174 and 75 is the more that polygamy is criminalized, the more that these practices are driven underground, the less informed and consent and consenting people are when they agree to be in these types of uh, non normal or non typical gender and uh, marriage dynamics, right? That is really a massive issue. Can they consent to it? However, if you open up legality of polygamy, if you make it so polygamy is acceptable and is not just, you know, marriage, polygamy is okay if you have a religious exemption, which is the way that some polygamy advocates are trying to, you know, acquire this is through religious exemptions, 
then you are you're coupling the religious component with the informed and consent, which in many ways people would agree that you can't be informed and consenting within the religious dynamic of polygamy because there's an inherent power dynamic of male superiority within those relationships. If it's decriminalized for everybody, if it is legal for everybody to marry multiple spouses, then you reduce the power that a specific religion has in putting a monopoly on the concept of polygamy. And only be, people who are allowed to practice polygamy are people who believe in a religious system that requires one man and multiple women, like in Mormon fundamentalism. Logan goes on to say, I find it somewhat ironic that so many laws and lifestyles have to be determined or restricted by religion, and I couldn't agree more. Gay marriage, mixed race marriage, abortion laws, etc., and we are only now slowly coming to the realization that they were stupid rules to begin with. However, with polygamy, it is specifically because of religion that the secular world has to be cautious, which I would say it's not just because of polygamy that people have to be cautious in their marriage decisions. I think that people always should be cautious and informed con and consenting in their marriage decisions. It just so happens that the concept of Mormon religious polygamy makes that uh, those basically insurmountable barriers to having informed consenting marriages. Finally, Logan wraps by saying, there would still be things to consider, even if the religion problem didn't exist before it could just be free game for polygamy, such as health insurance. There would need to be a process of declaring multiple adult spouses that would affect premiums. Yes, you're absolutely right. But what would we prefer? The system as it stands now, where these people operate underground and they're not listed as legal spouses, so they have no control, they have no power of attorney, they have no legal claim to their their uh, to uh, insurance protections uh, and to wills. Um, that's the system as it currently stands. So any system that allows those those uh, premiums to be calculated differently, that allows um, that, that allows legal protections for multiple spouses in any given marriage, is better for more people, right? Without that, the cost of premiums would rise across the board, even for those not practicing polygamy, i.e. pregnancy costs. But all of those are easy things to implement uh, that just means simple mouse clicks to solve. For me, the religious implications are the obstacles that are the most insurmountable. Only because any attempt to allow polygamy, but in a controlled fashion that didn't allow the mental programming of doctrinal requirements would be impossible without religions evoking separation of uh, church and state or persecution. Um, Logan wraps up by saying almost to the finish line where I'll be caught up. Keep up the great work. Signed Logan. So Logan, thank you for sending in the email. I generally don't disagree with, uh, what you say in the email, except for maybe a couple of minor points and the way that we get to the conclusions of making polygamy more acceptable for more people and not making it so only religious claims allow for polygamy, right? If polygamy is going to be legalized for specific religions, it's got to be legal for everyone, right? And th there are certain ways that religions have navigated getting specific exemptions. Like when it comes to employment practices, Christian organizations can discriminate against LGBTQ plus people because they have religious exemptions from equal protection clauses uh, in, in the Constitution, right? So... They, they have religious exemptions, and people have tried to navigate polygamy by creating religious exemptions for it. That's the complete wrong way to do it. The only way to do it, and I feel like this is a point that Philippa and I were trying to make in solidarity on those, those interview episodes, is that it has to be secular, and polygamy has to be legalized. At very least, decriminalized. It, it, but having it legalized would provide for protections for all of the people involved in those relationships. And you wouldn't have kids that are born and not given, you know, social security numbers and stuff. Um, you, you wouldn't have people who are living completely off the grid, completely off the map. And all of the abuse that comes from that shroud that we commonly see in fundamental, fundamentalist Mormon uh, polygamous sects. So Logan, good email, well thought out. I wanted to read the whole thing and respond to it uh, point by point on the podcast because I uh, really appreciate getting in well thought out um, emails and correspondence like this, even if they are from episodes that are a long time ago. One more email that I wanted to read. Uh, this, uh, this actually came in as a Facebook message from Anonymous. And this anonymous person said, hey, Bryce, a post-Mormon ex-stake president here, which ooh, Mormon royalty. All right. 
I was a former patron supporter, but had to back away from post Mormon podcasts for a while. I totally get that anonymous. A lot of people have sent me messages in the past saying similar things that listen to your podcast for a while. I was listening to all of the Mormon podcasts, but I couldn't do it after a while. So I had to take a step back. But then anonymous goes on to say, Recently, I listened to your Entheogen series and was completely blown away. And if listeners, if you don't know what that is, it's psychedelics and early Mormonism. Especially because in the past year, I have had several psilocybin trips that I now consider to be the most powerful spiritual experiences of my life. All those 50 years that I was chasing subtle feelings of the spirit, then shrooms and bam, I see a tree of life and more parallels to things that prophets saw than I can list here. Today, my wife told me about your podcast on the 116 pages and loved it. Thank you so much for all the hard work and all the great podcasts. So I want to just say to Anonymous, thank you so much for sending in that message. When I get feedback like that, it just, it burns my bosom. It makes me really happy. And it was very encouraging to get that email and uh, for you to share, you know, just a little bit of your own, let's say your own personal mycology research in that regard. So Anonymous, thank you so much for that that uh, message, which leads us to talk about or something we talked about last week. We're canceling the event coming up on April 19th, Bicycle Day 2020. In case you didn't catch it last episode, we have slated for Bicycle Day 2020 a, a lecture, a, a, I guess you could call it a live show sort of because it would air on the show, on, on the podcast feed, a, a lecture about psychedelics and early Mormonism, as well as a walking tour of Gilgal Gardens and VIP uh, ticket holders get access to a dinner with the organizers and myself. But we have, in light of recent events and with COVID-19, coronavirus known colloquially, uh, we have postponed that event. We are not sure. The organizers and I have been in constant contact since uh, the outbreak has happened and deciding what to do about this event. We have decided to postpone. We are aiming for some time in September with the hopes that society has returned to normal by September. So I'm going to keep you guys updated on this podcast feed as well as on our social media page about that event. If you got your tickets already, hang on to the tickets. Uh, You can ask for a refund if you would like and you can get that refund or hang on to your tickets. They're still going to be valid for the postponed date. Like I said, we're going to probably be aiming for a late September date as long as uh, society is not in a current, its current state of social distancing. We're, We're really going to aim for that. And that's just a tentative date at the moment. If for whatever reason we are unable to, uh, you know, Governments and uh, uh, doctors are unable to bring coronavirus under control by late September, then we will postpone it to later. And we're just going to play it by ear. But for now, we're looking for end of September in Salt Lake City, beginning at Salt Lake City Library. So hang on to your tickets or get a refund. Um, But if you want to hang on to them, they will always be valid for whenever the event does actually happen if you already purchased your tickets. So with that, let's finally wrap up the show. We have... A few new patrons to thank. We have a new pledge, a very, very generous pledge, getting this person into Nemo Outer Darkness from Aaron. Thank you so much. They are at the demon level. That is pretty hardcore. The demons of the show really hold up the pillars of support for the podcast. We also have a new pledge from Gene. I believe it's Gene. Maybe it's Jean. Maybe it's Jeannie. I'm not sure. But from Gene, who I've shared Facebook correspondence with, as well as from Kent. So to all of our new patrons, to all of our patrons, we have a lot of you. And I really, really do appreciate you giving me your hard-earned money, even at a time when markets are a little volatile and and there's a lot of questions currently up in the air. So listeners who do pledge to support the show at patreon.com like these new three pledges uh, from these new fantastic listeners, they get extra access to extra episodes every single week. Beyond extra episodes, you get an extended edition of every episode with the variety show where I jump into the old not safe for work type of, uh, you know, show dynamic. It's, I just kind of blather for a while, but you know, some people seem to like it. So if you want to join those ranks, if you want to pledge to support this research endeavor, or if you just really like the show, sign up at patreon.com slash Nick and Mormonism. And if not, Hey, share it around. If you're enjoying what you're listening to, tell a friend, tag me in a uh, Facebook or a Reddit or a uh, Twitter thread. And uh, yeah, 
I'll see you on the internet, I suppose. <laughs> but hey, you know what? You still hit the download button. You're still hanging out to the end of the episode. You listen through all the listener mail and everything. You listen for a long time. I know it was a long episode today, but I want to thank you all so much for lending me your ear. I'll talk to you next time here on the Naked Mormonism Podcast. Podcast is produced with the help of Julie Briscoe as social media manager and Brian Ziegenhagen as audio engineer. Music is written and produced by Jason Camo of a lost state of mind bandcamp.com and used with permission. Legal counsel is provided by Andrew Torres of the Law Offices of P. Andrew Torres in the Opening Arguments podcast. Naked Mormonism is a production of Ground Gnomes LLC. Copyright 2020. All rights reserved.